Hello again, Grapple fans. Good afternoon, and welcome to another freestyle wrestling session. And a splash. Britain was once a place where villains wore silver capes, the good guys were faking it, and the most masculine man in the country was called Shirley. At 4pm every Saturday, the UK was in thrall to the wrestling. When 4 o'clock came, for a lot of people, we were their heroes. Professional wrestling started out as a violent sport before cleaning up its act. Hitting its heyday in the 60s, wrestling regularly drew TV audiences of 16 million. It played out like a soap opera. The quintessential good guys, like Big Daddy, would engage in epic battles with the baddies. People loved Big Daddy. He was one of the big figures of the 1980s. He wasn't a brilliant wrestler because he was more fueled by best bitter and poise than he was by exercise and chip. The baddies were Mick McManus or the masked men like Kendo Nagasaki who would never reveal their true identities until they lost. The mythology was that one of them was a very prominent member of the royal family. So I used to think, who could it be? Is it Prince? Is it Prince Philip? The fans loved it and bought into it a bit too much. And if they didn't like someone, they would hit them in the back and think nothing. And we've even had cigarettes stubbed out on our backs. Once some chap come up and stuck a foot and mouth injection in the back of my bottom. But by the 80s, wrestling seemed out of step with popular culture. The bubble burst. The sport of wrestling is being counted out on television tomorrow after 33 years. This is the story of the rise and fall of professional wrestling. The champions, the characters, and of course, the rabid grannies. <laughs> Greetings, grapple fans. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this real humdinger of a professional wrestling session here from the Wembley Town Hall in London. Nineteen sixty-two, a smoky Wembley filled to the rafters. Jackie Palo versus Mick McManus. This bout that everybody's been waiting to see. The stage is set for an epic battle between two rivals, a grudge match. They drew 22 million people to one bout that they had, which was almost half a Great Britain. The rivalry was talked about by the whole nation, and this was their first high-profile contest. For the following seven days, it seemed like the whole country had seen the wrestling. You never met anyone who hadn't seen it. Everyone knew what a go was going on. Everyone was discussing it. And now Mick McManus. In the right corner was Mick McManus, one of wrestling's most famous villains instantly recognisable because of his Dracula-style black hairdo. Mick, super. Mick were all action. There were no mincing. When the bell rang, Mick came out full of it, you know, like, and the crowd loved that. As soon as he entered the rings, the fans absolutely hated him. He was the man that we loved to hate. Mick McManus! There's Jackie Palo. Refusal of McManus to take on this boy from Highbury. On his left, his arch nemesis, Jackie, Mr. TV, Palo. A charismatic figure who wore striped trunks and a gold lame jacket. Palo, more flamboyant, the pigtail bombastic star from Highbury. He was considered sensational just because he wore a ribbon in his hair and wore striped trunks. He presented himself a little glamorous, he had a little bit of glitter on, and he used to waggle his head and come. When they come, go on, Palo, you rubbish, yes, but you paid to come and see me, they're all that stuff like. Mick McManus in the black trunks with the, the short widow's peak combed downwards. Now this is the needle match of all needle matches. Palo has been trying to get this southern area Welterweight champion McManus to agree to this bout for a long time without success. Their dislike of one another was notorious. This was stoked by promoters eager to maximise their appeal. Apollo 
chops now on the forearm smash. If he starts that forearm smash, but an attempted leg dive on the bell, and McManus won't stop. And Stan Stone really trying to separate these two men. Oh, this is going to be a humdinger. All in all, there were six high-profile grudge matches fought over the next 11 years. And they really didn't like each other. I mean, they loved each other in the ring because it meant that they were top of the bill and they were all earning, you know, both of them were earning kind of great money. Um, and they brought each other up, if, if you like. Um, but in the end, what had become a kind of showbiz thing really developed into a, a real thing. Both men just going to slog it out from now on. They won't have time to think what... This happen. match between McManus and Palo marked the start of professional wrestling's golden age. It was the seamless blend of sport and entertainment which captured the imagination of the public. As a sport, it called for strength and agility, but as an entertainment, it called for the skills of an actor. Wrestling's origins are appropriately in the music hall. It was at the turn of the 20th century that wrestling was first added to the bottom of the music hall bill. By 1904, it was the most talked about sport in Britain. Wrestling been got a long time, it has. It goes right back to the music hall days when they used to roll a mat out on the stage. They'd have it in the paper that there's five or 20 pound for any young man that can pin his shoulders to the mat for three. And there were always young, strong lads working in building trades. From this Barnum-style sideshow, it progressed to the ring. The first official world heavyweight was George Hackenschmidt, the Russian lion. But there was little drama to his fight because Hackenschmidt was so good. The great George Hackenschmidt decided that since he could beat most of the opponents around legitimately in about two minutes, this wasn't a great spectacle. Hackenschmidt realised he needed help. Enter promoter C.B. Cochran, a music hall impresario who began to teach him the art of showmanship. The bouts started to last a lot longer with supporting bouts and that's where modern professional wrestling was born. By the 1930s, the sport was everywhere, but it had mutated into an all-in form of wrestling. A free-for-all of biting, gouging and chair hurling. This no-holds-barred style of wrestling wasn't licensed or controlled by anybody. It was a, a very macho man affair, you know, like, it had been labelled the grunt and groan game. Probably meant good for that period, you know, they used to sweat in the holes and hang on, they did it. And the crowd responded according to the efforts. Weapons were part of the proceedings, and you could even be kicked in the testicles. Most matches ended in brawls inside and outside the ring. It was eye gouging and ear biting. There was no national structure. The rules weren't clear. It was called all in wrestling or catch as catch can wrestling. Nobody was really clear what was going on. It was a, a, a long series of very successful one off bouts, but it didn't have any future. There was no great brain behind it. Due to this excessive violence, London County Council banned pro wrestling in the late 1930s, leaving the business in rough shape just before the outbreak of World War II. But in post-war Britain, Admiral Lord Mount Evans would sail to the rescue. He was about to bring wrestling some much-needed credibility. He chaired a House of Lords committee to clean up the sport. It drew up a new set of rules for a good clean fight which still form the backbone of wrestling today. This is uh, the main start to a match. This would be the important lock-up where you can push the gentleman this way, he can push him this way. And it's just a way of getting the better of each other wrestler. In this new era, the referee had much more control over proceedings. And then once we get onto the ropes, 
The referee would then make you break the hold. These rules reinvented wrestling as a more gentlemanly sport. Go back to this hold again, the old start position. Everybody slump. Lord Mount Evans was apparently doing for wrestling what Queensbury had done for boxing. Again, we start up with a link up as before. Take over. I've got his arm locked then. That's my arm. I can take it where I want. And then the idea is to twist his arm until either he submits or some wrestlers are clever and they can get out of this move. But in reality, Lord Mount Evans was merely a figurehead. The real brains and the brawn behind the plan was an amateur wrestler called Norman Morell. Norman Morell were very skillful promoters. Norman had been a former British amateur wrestling champion and gone to the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. I don't know if they met Adolf Hitler, but he were there. Morell used the influence of Lord Mount Evans to rebrand wrestling, transporting it from the gutter back to the mainstream. It was very much in their interest to show that theirs was a new product, a new product and an improved product. Next, Morell joined forces with other regional promoters to form a cartel. They were about to build a wrestling empire under the name Joint Promotions. Their success we kind of see as the beginning of 25 golden years, 1952-53, when wrestling uh, professional wrestling absolutely peaked in this country. In the here, in the blue corner, from London, we have Stephen Logan. Wrestling now moved from a period when it was deemed too unruly and too violent to an era when it was socially acceptable and joint promotions were in total control. And once they had this control, they began to manufacture the outcome of matches. The main promoters realised that we can't just have a bout where one person wins and that was the end of it. You had to keep it going, you had to develop the narrative both of the characters and also of, of, you know, who they fought, who they won, and then someone would come back and they would beat them, and so that would carry on. Oh, a real flying tackle, but over the top of the cross, close by Wall. Surely it holds him, yes, there it is. Because of this behind-the-scenes manipulation, people have always suspected that wrestling is fake. This has always been a critic's question, I condense it down to this. Those people who like professional wrestling, no explanations needed. For those who don't like it, any explanation would not be acceptable. Amongst the old pros, you're still fairly quiet about it, you know. Um, Why is that? I don't know, it's, it's like a closed shop. So more memory. Someone who is happy to talk about it is professional comedian Will Hodgson. He was a wrestler for two years. I've learned one thing from getting in the wrestling rings. Wrestling is not fake. Wrestling, ladies and gentlemen, is fixed. <laughs> There's a big difference, a golf, a golf a difference. If I put you in the ring with Floyd Mayweather, mate, and said, don't worry about it, I'll fix the fight, lay down in the 12th round, you'd be rightly concerned about the preceding 11 rounds and the damage. Despite the fixed result, nothing was rehearsed. Wrestlers were still very competitive, taking real knocks and real risks. Wrestling in Britain was never, ever choreographed. In actual fact, if you wanted to get a smash in the face from a wrestler, just say to him, like, do you have to rehearse this? We heard that a few times, and I tell you what, there's one or two, there's one or two wrestling fans um, got to learn the hard way. <laughs> they were absolutely ad-libbed in the ring, and that was sort of the key thing. And that's, in fact, what made them a great wrestler. If they could ad-lib well enough to convince you that it was real, no matter how spectacular a wrestler was, 
it was up to joint promotions who won. They were busy creating a soap opera with a simple morality. The first thing was to easily identify who you should cheer for and who you should boo. There were the good guys, or the blue eyes as they were known. Frank Reimer was an archetypal blue eye, blonde and good looking. I would be, I suppose, what you would call a blue eye. Uh, so uh, the villains would, would tend to knock me around a little bit. I, I would sort of keep to the rule books as much as I could. People should know within seconds of clapping eyes on you which one you are. A good looking male will be a blue eye. A nice pretty boy will be a blue eye. I was a goody goody. I wasn't the best looking guy around, nearly, but I wasn't quite the best looking guy around. And then there were the villains or the heels, who tended to look a lot harder and flaunt the rules. I said to an old, old wrestler one time, Steve Logan, and I saw him training in the gym and he was coming out some beautiful holds. I said, Steve, why don't you use those holds in the ring? He said, look at me, I'm bloody ugly. He said, doesn't matter what I do in the ring, they still boo me. The evil foreigner heel. Used to be a classic one. All the masked men are usually heels because you don't trust men with masks on. Even though masks look really cool, they're hiding something and they're up to some dastardly plot. The story in the ring would play out with the hero initially taking a pounding. They're slowly getting the very life and consciousness suffocated out of them. The referee will then lift the arm and it will come down like a rag doll. And on the old days, they used to have like an old woman from the St. John's Ambulance and sometimes come on and try and revive the wrestler with smelling salts or brandy or what have you to try and get him out of it. But it, it looked like they were, they'd been, like they were, might be experiencing brain death. I see St. John's anywhere to be found. St. John's. There's those old ladies with their handbags, completely believed he was, he was a very nice man that was being beaten up by a very nasty man, and they were on the side of the nice man, and they didn't want him to be hurt. It was incredible theatre. In the end, the hero would usually triumph with a last-minute victory. Any movie you go to, you wait for the villain to get his comeuppance at the end. I mean, that's what you do. The fans didn't care in the end that it was fixed. It was like seeing a good play. You know they're actors, but you suspend your disbelief. It's tough working class guys doing this sort of science fiction comic book pantomime. And if you're like me, someone who's not good at sport, it's a sport that appeals to you, because it is a sport, but it's not really a sport. But what did it take to become a champion? In a drama scripted by John Promotions, how did you get to the top? One wrestler who climbed the ladder under joint promotions was Mick McManus. Emerging from the RAF after the war, he entered the professional ring for the first time in 1948. It was this man who was to become the most influential villain or heel of all time. He looked hard, like sort of pub fighting hard, like he could count, like he could take someone outside and put them over the bonnet of a car or something, that sort of hardness, not bodybuilding hardness, street toughness. I think the best heels had that street toughness, looked like the, like the sort of guy your dad would play skittles with. There's no doubt that Mick McManus knew how to work a crowd. He was so skilled at arousing the audience, they absolutely hated every gesture. The way he could spit, not quite accurately, the water into the bucket. The way he would just sneer and engage the ringside seaters in nasty back chat, really quite insulting. And the way he would win his bouts, usually by some lucky twist of fate towards the end, overcoming a heavier, younger, more attractive, more skillful opponent. He, he perfected the persona of an objectionable character without a redeeming feature. But this man was the absolute very essence of a professional wrestler. Mick was carving his own niche as the man we love to hate. He also acquired his own catchphrase. In the 60s, it seemed that this was all you needed to propel you to stardom. I'm free. 
seems like a nice boy. I didn't get where I am today without having a little champagne, not too much, just enough. Oh, you are awful. But I like you. Nice to see you. To see you! He had these enormous cauliflower ears, and of course they hurt when you do get them hit. So he was forever saying, don't touch the ears, leave the ears, and it, it became like a catchphrase for him. The one thing that drives McManus more crazy than anything else, treatment to the head, especially the ears. He put his hands over the ears and warned the wrestler not to touch his ears. There was probably nothing at all wrong with his ears, but it created huge reaction amongst the fans because all we wanted to do was see a wrestler get hold of those ears. Promoters capitalised on Mick's box office appeal by setting up the infamous grudge matches with Jackie, Mr. TV Palo, a wrestler Mick was known to dislike. One and only TV Jackie Palo. These bouts were a massive draw. The hatred was genuine, and those who witnessed McManus and Palo fight live believe it wasn't fixed. After that mass of the lost box, this versus Mick McManus in the black trunks with the the short. Every so often, there's a fight called a shoe, where they still have to work within the rules, but they it, it, it's a real fight. Pop artist Peter Blake was among the 8,000 capacity audience for their 1967 match. They came in. You know, they kind of shook hands, I suppose. The fight started, and Mick McManus butted Jackie Palo. You, you gave, gave him a, you a head butt. And then they came together and he nutted him again. And he probably did it 30 times, with no holds going on, you know, just grabbing each other. And, and then Jackie Palo realized that his head was totally split open there's blood pouring anywhere, and the fight couldn't go on. I mean, it's, so it was absolutely genuine street fight. Whether these fights were real or fixed is still hotly debated today. But the public loved them, and audiences flocked to their local halls to see the wrestling. I'm in the Victoria Hall at Halifax in Yorkshire. It's owned by the council and it's used for all kinds of entertainments, but they don't all bring a full house like tonight's. This crowd has come to see what's always a big attraction, all in wrestling. For the mainly working class audience, wrestling was accessible and cheap entertainment in their backyard. I always think of the wrestling, they think Big Daddy, McManus, and rabid old grannies. The unique thing about wrestling is that it pulled in a large female audience, genteel grannies who would suddenly start baying for blood. Oh, I love it. We used to have uh, quite an interaction with the old ladies, the granny brigade. They would bring their umbrellas and their high heel shoes, and if they didn't like someone, they would hit them in the back and think nothing. And we've even had cigarettes stubbed out on our backs. Klondike Kate was one of the few female wrestlers who played the villain. No one knew how to wind an audience up like her, and she regularly felt the full force of an angry crowd. I used to get called all sorts of different names, really derogatory names, and I think if I was in the street and got said that too, I'd be really upset. But being part and parcel of what it was all about, the name calling didn't really matter. All I knew was I was doing my job right by winding these people up, and I did really wind them up. When you go out, the crowd were just the same, and they'd be grabbing for you and trying to, trying to hurt you. No, she wants shooting. She definitely wants shooting. Uh, because she's dirty, definitely not dirty. To be called she's a not woman. to be called a wrestler. Yes. How she's the nerve to walk in the ring looking like that, I don't know, in front of all these people. She's got no shame at all. No, she hasn't. No. no. None at all. She's, she's just a dirty it. big fat lump of lard. I've been in the ring and, and sort of stuck my backside out to the crowd 
And once a chap come up and stuck a foot and mouth injection in the back of my bottom where it hit my nerve and all down my sciatic nerve and I ended up in hospital a couple of days. <laughs> So much of the success of wrestling was based on the interaction between the wrestlers and the crowd. And in the local halls around the country, joint promotions were making good money, but they were cultivating a deal behind the scenes that would take wrestling into the living rooms of the entire nation. When ITV launched World of Sport in 1965, wrestling became a weekly primetime fixture. Welcome, Grapple fans. Television is a thing that you've got to have in any form of, call us sport or entertainment, I don't care, call us entertainers, but you've got to have a shop window. Now this afternoon we're really going to see two at least of the most tremendous spots we've probably ever seen on television. A regular spot on World of Sport legitimised wrestling as a sport as it sat alongside football and horse racing, but it also injected the razzmatazz. The big characters emerged. That's not to say you had to have a mask or you had to weigh, you know, 45 stone, but it, it helped if you had a, a persona, a shtick, um, because the guys who would just run rings, you know, around uh, an opponent and be real, really very good technical wrestlers were actually quite boring on TV. When it ran contest. To maintain audience interest, personality and image came more and more to the fore. You know, we all are actors on a stage. You know, I didn't make that up. It was the old William Shakespeare thing. And it's true. Life can be very low-keyed and miserable without a little bit of panache, I'll use that word. And wrestling, of course, in this country, needed that. Ricky Starr, who in fact is a ballet dancer, is wearing ballet shoes. He wanted personalities. There were no doubt about that. The fact that it was now being put into people's homes and became a big family entertainment added the entertainment side to it. And then the wrestlers themselves needed to do more in order to keep that attention. Wrestlers who didn't have a strong image found their days were numbered. A lot of the really good guys just got left behind by TV because they didn't have their, you know, their particular uh, act. A good gimmick could take a wrestler from the middle of the pack to the top of the bill, but it wasn't always the wrestler's choice what that gimmick was. Never mind about the Barbados, they just couldn't spell Battersea. I was born and brought up in Battersea, you know, and when I first went to joint promotions, um, I said, would it be okay if I'm billed as a coloured cockney? And Jack Dow, the governor, looked me up and down and went, well, you are um, of Caribbean origin, and so let's keep it to the Caribbean, shall we? Barbados. I went, thank you. So I became a Barbadian, never leaving Battersea. <laughs> Even then, he realised he didn't stand out entirely from the crowd. There was a lot of black wrestlers around. Honey Boy Zimbo, um, Johnny Quango, Mass and Buller, the most famous one. So I thought I, I had to stick out. I was just become a non-entity. He did something drastic. I bleached my hair blonde. The following week after I did my hair, I had a live TV match and it didn't matter where I walked um, or drove, people were honking me in their cars and putting their thumbs up. Aye, aye. They were either saying, look at that idiot over there, or that's that guy who wrestled like, you know, with blonde hair. Johnny Kincaid wasn't the only wrestler who had issues. <laughs> Tony Francis called me Big Bertha 
And I was horrified and I said, no way, I am not. He said, you'll be do as you're told. You're called Big Biff. And I went to Bob. I said, Bob, I can't stand this. Please don't make me be called Big Biff. And what he did was he said, right, we'll change your name and we'll call you Klondike Kate. Your dad's a Mountie in the Canadian police. Actually, my dad was a steel worker, five foot two, and worked on a steel works in Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> as I understand, Klondike Kate is actually the owner of a brothel in the Klondike uh, from the Gold Rush. The personas developed for the television audience ranged from the sublime to the ridiculous. It needed that sparkling in, because people wanted to be able, when they sat in home, they wanted somewhere where they said, hey mother, have you seen him coming out? And they didn't come with much more sparkle than the exotic Adrian Street. Adrian Street. Shiny, shiny, shiny boots of leather. The thing about Adrian Street was, um, you know, his dad worked down the mine, and that was the last thing he was ever going to do. And they were, you know, the, the classic story is true. You could either become a pop star or you could become a sports star. And he saw wrestling as, as his way out of, 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 of Wales and, you know, the pit life. I sort of suffered a lot of uh, ridicule uh, from my father and from the other coal miners. Little guys like you, you can't be a professional wrestler. They'd rip you in half. Um, I was determined that I was going to make it. I remember standing on the bottom of the pit for the last time and I already got myself a job in London. I was leaving. I was never going to come back. I was going to be a professional wrestler or die trying. In his teenage years, Adrian began bodybuilding. He stepped into the ring for the first time in 1957 as Kid Tarzan, but soon realized that he needed a better gimmick. I knew by that time I was a great wrestler, but I thought of myself a great wrestler Stand up in a pretty package, it'd be better and would stand out a lot more than the more conservative style and the more conservative appearance that, that professional wrestlers had. Imagine, I had a 27 inch waist, a 48 inch chest at the same time, I had a great suntan, I knew I looked fantastic. Now, I'd already been told by the wrestlers, you're not going in the ring looking like that, you are, oh, you look bloody ridiculous, you know. Um, naturally, I put it down to uh, jealousy. Adrian thought he was going out dressed as a hot boy for the ladies, but it didn't quite work out that way. Instead of like the uh, positive reaction I thought I'd get, it was like, ooh, Mary, give us a kiss, ooh, doesn't she look cute? And um, to say I was mortified, I was horrified, um, would be an understatement. Adrian's cross-dressing, highly sexualized character was really pushing the boundaries of society, never mind sport. But Adrian took the view that no publicity was bad publicity and began to milk it. Because he was big and tattooed, people couldn't work him out. They're like, is he straight? Is he gay? And he was never upfront about it. He'd never answer that I think that wound people up even more but I like the way there's this combination of like toughness and glam with him he looked like a sort of combination between Emma Bunton and a Welsh coal miner secretary round three round three and Adrian Street there he is on the left he ignited the fans' fears and prejudices, and perhaps homophobia, with the very minimum of pirouetting and prancing around the ring. He was a great wrestler, a great athlete, and fans really couldn't understand why a man like this was parading around the ring in the way he, he, which he did. But at the end of six rounds it may not be. This is a catchweight contest, he's giving away a lot of weight. Every time I appeared on TV I'd wear a different gown. Every, every, every time I wrestled, I'd push the envelope just a little further, just a little further, and a little further. And it's a mission. 
Adrian's image worked wonders at the box office, and lo and behold, he had success in the ring. I won the uh, middleweight European title, and the newspapers got a hold of it. They wanted to take a photograph of me wearing the championship belt, and they said, like, where would you like to have this taken? And I said, at the coal mine where I worked when I was 15, when the miners were coming up the uh, pit, the same miners, including my father, that predicted that I would never ever make a professional wrestler. His dad is, is looking totally perplexed by, you know, what his son has become. Um, and there, there's a great cage of miners behind him, one of whom has his mouth open and his eyes wide, and he really can't believe what he's, he's seeing. And there's a real kind of F.U. kind of moment where Adrian, who never liked his dad, um, said, OK, I've made it, you know, I've got out of here. I'm here, I'm here down the shaft for two minutes, and that's it. The winner, Adrian Street. It wasn't just sexual ambiguity that provoked wrestling crowds. Prejudice reared its head again when Johnny Kincaid teamed up with Dave Soulman Bond for tag team wrestling. This is an international tag team contest of 20 minutes duration. Fighting in pairs was an innovation joint promotions had introduced to the UK, where wrestling stars were put together and given their own team name. Together wrestle as the Caribbean Sunshine Boys. Caribbean Sunshine Boys. At that time, neither of us had seen the Caribbean. <laughs> Flaunting the rules and defying the referee was standard practice for a wrestling villain. But this was the 70s, when potentially racist reactions were more likely. We didn't try that hard. We was only doing exactly what the other so-called villains were doing, but it took off. The fact that Johnny Kincaid was mixed race and Dave Bond was black and playing villains to perfection would prove a red rag for some. Breaks them. And Kincaid having a ball the other side while the Max Ward's back is turned. Oh, there was a lot of heat, believe you me, yeah. Okay, we had a few fights out the ring because of we had um um 25 National Front one time in the hall. And the referee's had enough. The referee has disqualified the Caribbean Sunshine Boys. So that's it, an exciting finish. And somebody trying to throw water about. He's going to be in trouble if Kincaid catches him. He's going to have his neck broken. In the interest of safety, after just one televised fight, the Caribbean Sunshine Boys were split up by joint promotions. I don't know if it was racial, but we was getting too big. And they have to control you. The promotions have to control you. If your face fits, fine. Um, if it doesn't, then it doesn't matter what you do, you don't get very far. Whatever the reasons, joint promotions knew TV was a cash cow and didn't want anything to jeopardise their precious TV contract. The television contract was the prized possession, very carefully won over a number of years by joint promotions and not to be sacrificed at all, thanks to rigorous promotion and high discipline. Someone who was initially considered too much of a maverick for TV was the most notorious masked wrestler of them all. There are wrestlers who adopt a persona, and there are wrestlers who live it. Kendo Nagasaki is a self-styled enigma. This man appeared from nowhere in November 1964 with this incredible costume, kendo outfit, and to back all, all of this up, outstanding wrestling skills and strength. Oh yes, suplex, beauty. 
it's a beautiful backdrop. A highlight amongst which for fans is his very, very dangerous uh, kamikaze role in which he turned a somersault with a wrestler on top of his head and landed head down on that wrestler's stomach in the centre of the ring. Worth the entrance fee alone just to witness that. And Kincaid in trouble, now the kamikaze crash, there it is. The kamikaze crash with his head bleeding. Kendo was wrestling in halls all over the UK, but joint promotions kept him off our TV screens for the next seven years. And From his 1964 debut through to 1971, Kendo Nagasaki didn't appear on television wrestling. And the reasons for this, we can deduce, would be that his persona and his uh, outrageous and very fierce ring antics were just a little bit too much for genteel tea time television around the country. But by 1971, the promoters could no longer ignore the allure of Kendo Nagasaki, and he was finally allowed on World of Sport. This was when the obsession began. Who was that masked man? My ambition was to be Kendo Nagasaki. Right from the beginning, he was an intriguing figure. He, he always won. The, the, the myth was that he never spoke, um, and that he was Japanese, and he was a mystery man. The myth was that he had some sort of big Japanese samurai connection, and he would come in with um, this great sword and throw salt over his um, shoulders. His first manager, gorgeous George Gillette, who would do all the verbals because masked men, you know, don't talk in case it gave away their identities. The greatest wrestler in the world today, the mighty masked and mysterious King Kendo Nagasaki. Most masked wrestlers are in the game for a few years, defeated and then ritually unmasked. Count Bartelli, the Zebra Kid, the Outlaw. And the mask is on his way, it's up to his top lip already. Everybody wanted to see what was underneath that mask. This was the, the old idea of it. He wore a mask to hide his identity because um, he was a businessman, right? And um, if people saw his face, right, they'd rather talk about the wrestling than the business. So that was the idea of wearing a mask. But he was good enough to keep it on. You know, he was a good wrestler. After resisting the efforts of others to unmask him, he voluntarily revealed himself to the public in 1977. He was unmasked and his features were seen for the first time and his features were quite sensational with a largely shaven head and mysterious tattoo on his forehead. But once he had exposed his face, Nagasaki realised the mystique had been lost and put his mask back on six months later. Today, Kendo Nagasaki still refuses to remove his mask or speak on camera. His answers are spoken through his spiritual advocate. The man behind the mask was guided by the spiritual being, Kendo Nagasaki, um, to become a professional wrestler and to wear a mask. Kendo Nagasaki himself has had uh, lives on the earthly plane um, as a samurai warrior. Um, he was Shinwemon Nagasaki, who perished in the siege of Kamakura in 1333, and he lived in the great city of Nagasaki at the dawn of the Tokugawa shogunate in uh, the early 1600s. And the man behind the mask himself has gone be uh, through past life regression, uh, in which he's uh, seen himself um, sharing lives and fighting alongside Kendo Nagasaki during these times. Kendo. I'll call him Kendo, although of course that's not his real name. And Peter will call him because that was his first name. Within the world of wrestling, the identity of Kendo Nagasaki is an open secret. But on the outside, the name Peter Thornley is the extent of what we know. Well, almost. He had like half a finger on one hand and there was all this mystique about how that came about. It had been cut off in some Japanese ritual 
Um, and in the end, of course, we find out that he lost it in some sort of industrial accident in a factory near his house in Wolverhampton. Kendo Nagasaki's actions were front page news. Professional wrestling had become so successful that it had penetrated every aspect of popular culture. And there you see, Mac McManus, don't you? Yes. Prince Philip and Her Majesty the Queen used to come to the Albert Hall every month and see the wrestling, regular as clockwork, great fans. Um, the Beatles and Mick McManus were great buddies. The wrestlers were everywhere. Many were regulars on the Generation Game. TV. It is Mick McManus. There we are then, Mick. <laughs> you want to get a nose like that? You couldn't ask, could you? But behind the scenes, a shift was about to take place. By the mid-70s, the old guard of joint promotions were keen to retire, but they had a successor in mind. I don't give a damn what the doctor says, he must be there. For all its success, wrestling needed a shot in the arm. Fans were tiring of the familiar names. What we'll do then, Keith? Max Crabtree you. knew it was time to innovate or die. We had to just try and bring it in a little bit with a bit of flair. It was the only way, you know, it, it needed some a kick up the backside, you know. It was at this point that from the dole queue came Max's middle-aged brother, Shirley Crabtree. He had been a wrestler, but none of his previous gimmicks had broken through. He came to see me, he said, uh, I don't know, he said, I seem to have run into a brick wall now, me old career's gone, old dick cock. I said, listen, I want you to be big daddy. I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall big daddy would change the face of wrestling and become one of the most revered and reviled names on the British scene. Weighing in at 23 stone with a massive 64 inch chest, he was the first of the super heavyweights. Big Daddy was an immediate hit with the audience, revitalizing the flagging sport. The flyer, but uh, Big Daddy's body was there, just like a brick wall, and he bounces off. There, larger than life, would be Big Daddy, stood there, making his way through again. Occasionally there's one or two little children and Shirley were always quick to pick up the thing, he'd hold their hands and he'd march down to the ring with them, he would, and he'd become a people's champion. People loved Big Daddy, can't overstate enough how popular Big Daddy was. He was one of the big figures of the 1980s, he was everywhere, he was on, the, on kids telly, he was in Buster comic, he'd bought Buster comic and Big Daddy had a cartoon strip in there, he had an annual, the same as Spider-Man and Superman and Dennis the Menace had their annuals, Big Daddy had an annual as well, he wasn't so much a, a bloke, he was kind of, he was a real life superhero in that, a living cartoon character and no matter what people, what, no matter what the reality is of what Shirley Crabtree was as a bloke or what he thought of kids, kids loved him. Big Daddy was so big that today, if you ask anyone about wrestling, his is the first name likely to be mentioned. A fringe play has even been written about this hugely popular but very unathletic sportsman. <laughs> You probably noticed by now, I'm not exactly, what's the word, I'm fit. Well, I wouldn't put it like that exactly, but I'm a big man, 23 stone, and I'm, how can I put this, uh, oh, past the first blush of youth. Uh, therefore, there's a few of the traditional wrestling moves it's probably best to avoid, like uh, all of them. Ooh. Ooh. So, I had to limit myself to the range of moves I could do. First up, we have the forearm smash. <laughs> then... The so-called belly bot. And my signature move, the belly splash. Oh, for God's sake, no! Submit! Submit! Ah, oh, perhaps not here. And, well, that was about it, really. Well, then, just back in against Big Daddy. But fame didn't just arrive. Big Daddy's brother, Max, had to work at it. 
he decided to recreate the drama of the McManus Palo feud with Big Daddy and another super heavyweight, Giant Haystacks, who weighed in at an incredible 40 stone. You and me, you and me, let's fight to the finish, and then me, come on Haystacks, let's see what you can do. Yeah, Emma, what's that now with you? There's a magic of certain people I mean, when I put giant hay sacks on, because of his enormous size, he was very recognisable. The six foot eleven, the forty stone, the giant hay sacks. In the build-up to their big grudge match at Wembley, giant hay stacks, with his Irish background, was portrayed as the Celtic wild man villain versus Big Daddy who, with his very British image, was clearly meant to be the good guy. They'd become emblematic of, 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 of traits of British character. And, and you know, uh, Big Daddy sells himself as a modern John Bull, really. You know, he comes and he's got a Union Jack West skirt, top hat. He, top hat, he wears a tin helmet during the Falcons. He's very deliberately making himself into the it's called blitz spirit. John Bull and giant haystacks. Uh, Martin Ruane, He was he was you know, Irish by birth, and he's very deliberately summoning up something Celtic, and and rural, and and sort of pagan yeah. and untamed. You know, he's a great. So he was wearing sort of bib overalls. You know, yeah. and he's uh, a, a wild man. In the one corner, we have John Bull. Civilization, the town, the city, empire. Versus in the other, wild, dark, untamed, pagan, rugged heath. We got any of them custard creams? Top draw. It's light versus dark, Shirley. The most primal struggle of all. Good versus evil. You'll be making hundred pound a night. But I can't stand it. No one can. That's the bloody point. You're about to go. Stratospheric. Got any bourbons? Kitchen table. The referee. The referee inside the ring. The referee inside the ring. Craig Green of London and Dave Rees from Shrewsbury. The referee outside the ring watching points. This part will continue and... Big Daddy vs Giant Haystacks at Wembley Arena in 1981 was the biggest wrestling event of the 80s, but the cracks were beginning to show. I was one of those kids that were cheering for Big Daddy and liked the big Yorkshireman squishing people, this big belly. We loved all of that, and, but I can see how that wouldn't sit well if you'd spent years mastering ring craft. Michael Brooks only. It became too much of a kind of um, kind of circus act, uh, and, and not enough sport. And I think you could you could you could say that the balance there was was wrong. Won't see many wrestling holes in this one as his touch goes clean out over the top rope, and it's a question whether he beats the count or not. He won't make it. He won't make it. The bout lasted for just 2 minutes 50 seconds. The pre-match build-up was longer. It was a far cry from the 25 minutes McManus and Palo fought. The huge uh, face-off at Wembley Arena in 1981. It's, it's, it's really quite lame. You know, it's, the, the, the audience aren't getting their money's worth. In fact, we got a lot of it over the commentary table at ringside. Big Daddy has always been a point of controversy amongst the boys, but I don't wish to be detrimental about anybody because wherever that man appeared, he put bums on seats, if excuse my language. He filled any hall that he was in, and, and that's what the business is about. No one's ever claimed it's the most sophisticated form of entertainment. Of course, much of it Despite is Big Daddy's popularity, wrestling suffered a steady decline throughout the 1980s. The sport had tipped over into pure spectacle, and the fans knew it. Thirty pounds a night, and there are clearly easier ways to make. It almost killed itself by refining itself to the point where the sporting element drifted away, and that was fine um, until you realised actually it had only become showbiz, and people had sort of cottoned on that actually what they were watching was the same thing over and over. Eventually, it it becomes irrelevant because they just get canned. It, it's a tragedy of leotards. The final nail in wrestling's coffin came in 1988. Greg Dyke, the director of programmes at LWT,
pulled wrestling off the air. Finally, the sport of wrestling is being counted out on television tomorrow after 33 years of regular televised bouts. Television throws out the grunt and groaners. As wrestling's audience has been halved over the years, it has to go. I think it was cancelled prematurely. I think it was done a massive disservice by being cancelled. I think it was cancelled when it was still popular. I think that Greg Dyke cancelled it because it was one of these for-your-own-good things, that it's not good for people, that it's low-brow entertainment and people should be watching something else. I'm going to end up playing the class card here, but I think people... The main audience of wrestling was working class and I think it was victim of a kind of sneery attitude by some of the media towards the people that were watching it. The idea was that it was being watched by people that were ignorant in some way because of their, because of their class, because of their background. One of the main problems is that the audience it attracts is not the sort of yuppie market so cherished by advertisers and television companies. The country had changed. Thatcher created this far more aspirational society and wrestling if it was anything, was not an aspirational uh, sport. And it looked faded, and it was still basically lost in the 60s. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't going to pull in the big ITV advertisers that were needed. But TV didn't kill off wrestling completely. It's still staged in live venues today. But without the shop window of television, it struggles to fill places like Croydon's Fairfield Hall. The Granny Brigade still love it. The wrestlers work hard. But the world of wrestling is a shadow of its former self. The old names of Rhymer, Kincaid and Street have a reunion every year and are still a hit with fans. But it seems that wrestling is now a niche sport. It no longer has its once universal appeal. Yet wrestling's heyday will live on long in the popular memory. The great characters, the great feuds and the wrestlers who put their bodies on the line for our entertainment. Those men gave their bodies night after night, smashing and banging around a ring for 40 years of their lives. Their hips and their knees have been replaced, but it was worth it to them because in that heyday, they were superstars. So let's give the wrestlers themselves the final word. I've been a wrestler for many a year. The game's been good to me. It's not as easy as people think. Take a look at me and see. My arms are broken, some teeth are gone. I find it hard to chew, but this is what most wrestlers get, trying to entertain people like you. They say it's bent and you say it's fixed and other names you call, but it ain't no joke on the old bloke who just lost the last fall. So to you people have your doubts, this game's a rough employment. Bones have been broken and men have died. For you, it's your every enjoyment.